Well, greetings, everyone. This is David Arendale. Our purpose of this video is to look at what are the common elements among most of the major peer learning programs that operate inside the United States and internationally around the world. Some of these elements will be true of all the programs. A few of the elements may not be true of every program, but at least it allows us to have a basic foundation for understanding what are the common issues, what are oftentimes the common parts of the programs, and also what are some of the common issues that they're trying to deal with. These are the six programs which I follow with my research. One of the things I'll do with this video is not read all the words on the PowerPoint slides. It's a lesson that my students taught me after years of teaching an introductory global history course. But what I'm looking for is what are common elements that help us to understand these programs better. In order to go into more detail about each one of these programs, I recommend that you go to this YouTube channel which I set up in which I have much more detailed videos that look at each of these programs. They're still not perfect. I'd still recommend that you read the professional literature for more detail, but at least inside of these videos, you'll be able to see more information about each one of them. However, I won't spend the time, as I do inside of this video, looking at what are the common objectives, what are the common issues that they're dealing with, because that's what the purpose of this video is for. So, first of all, just a quick thought. How do you select among this myriad of wonderful peer learning programs that are out there? Well, part of the reason why it's so complicated is that you've got answers to different questions here. What kinds of resources do you have at your institution regarding pay and resources and faculty interest and available student help? What's the climate like at your institution? Some of these programs foster better in some climates versus others. What are the specific needs that the students have? Different programs are uh, more appropriate for some student populations than others based off what those particular needs are. And then once you end up understanding those, then you're able to go and select the appropriate intervention program. I'll have a whole series of different videos that look at this whole decision-making process. Too often times it's easy to be influenced when you go to a conference and you hear a concurrent session talking about a program, and I'm sure it's a fine program. I did that for many, many years promoting uh, one of the programs that was on that list of six, which we just saw. But they don't always tell you all the information. They don't tell you what are the things that you got to do in order to make that program really work well. They only have 60, 75 minutes. Or if you end up looking at an article, well, part of the challenge with articles is that uh, publications is that probably half the time in the article it's spent on a research study. They don't always specifically tell you the kind of detailed information you need in order to implement it. So that's the reason why I suggest that you be really careful whenever you're thinking about a program and being a good consumer. Now, it's a little humorous to go over here and uh, pick on Doritos, but any time that you eat anything, we ought to read the label and the specific product information. Well, the same thing's true for whenever you're selecting a particular uh, intervention program. You have to go and to do deeper research, look at the fine print. Frankly, one of the most valuable things you can do is actually visit a nearby college that has this particular program and see if the director of the program uh, could spend a lunch hour with you or to allow you to actually go and watch some of the sessions in operation. That's going to give you the kind of detailed information that's going to help you to be able to make a more informed decision on which to pick from. Well, it's the power of the group. It is working with other fellow students, some of them more skilled, more knowledgeable, more advanced, but what we understand is that regardless of what the preparation level is, students have something to contribute 
And that's the reason why groups are so effective. Now, just to start off, let me just kind of start with a little cartoon that actually has a little more serious uh, import to it than it might appear. For a lot of students, they're all dealing with college by themselves. It's their own private mazes. Then at some point, students figure out ways to get together with each other. Now, these may be the people who are on their uh, residence hall floor or people who they sit next to inside of a class. Somehow they get together with other students. Now, some students, they don't get the opportunity to meet with others due to their obligations of time for a variety of reasons. Now, getting together with others, that's a good thing. And hopefully what you see happen is that because of them getting together as a group, it provides a synergistic impact that allows them to be able to do more than if they were just working by themselves up there dealing with the maze. Well, this is actually a much more complex cartoon than it appears because it really is part of why it is that PAL groups are effective. And the reason why some PAL groups are more effective than others, well, it's because of the program and for its protocol. One of the most influential researchers in student outcomes is Dr. Alexander Aston, along with his wife and fellow researcher, and also for all the graduate students who did their work on the research. So there was a big team, but I highly recommend that you end up Picking up this uh, book here, you can probably pick it up uh, used on Amazon for probably less than five bucks. It's one of the best research studies that shows the complexity of the college environment. And he looked at hundreds of variables that had an impact on students as they came into the institution, their experience while at the institution, and the outcomes that they experienced as a result of all of that interaction. And of all of the hundreds and hundreds of variables, well, the peer group was the most potent source of influence. Now, for me as a faculty member, I find that to be humbling. I would have thought it would be the faculty member who would be the most important influence on them. It doesn't diminish me as a teacher. It just reminds me of how impactful the student group is couple more quick quotes here. The magnitude of this peer group effect is really based off of how often that they're interacting and also the intensity and the quality of the experience. So in a sense, you could take uh, frequency times intensity equals impact. What we want to have happen is we want to have the best learning experience for the students, and that's the reason why peer learning groups, those that are intentional, they have a particular uh, set of protocols and activities which they engage in, well, they can end up having a bigger impact on this intensity experience, and they end up having a higher impact upon them. So once again, why is it that we care so much? Well, it's because we want to have the most positive group of students surrounding individual students to help them because they're going to become like them. Now, for me and my college experience, I didn't get a chance to participate in intentional study groups. I had some really nice people who I studied with that were in my classes. How did I pick them? Well, because they were within one or two chairs of me in the classroom, and I was able to talk with them, and I had a good experience from that. But, you know, some students, they don't get that chance, or the students who they're surrounded by aren't really all that committed to school, or lots of things that come in. That's the reason why we want to find ways to have a really positive influence upon the students. Now, what are some of the common, uh, common challenges that they're dealing with? I could spend half an hour just talking about uh, Tinto's six themes of attrition. I won't do that. I'll just simply encourage you, if you don't know anything about uh, Dr. Tinto, uh, just simply do a Google search and look for Tinto's themes of attrition, and you'll be able to find all kinds of articles uh, and publications about it. Let me just simply circle 
peer learning groups have a big impact on these four major causes of students dropping out of college. We can't do much about these bottom two down here, but it's a pretty significant group when you think about it. they can deal with four of those. Other ones are stereotype threat. Dr. Claude Steele pointed out that if you take a group of students and if you tell them that well, you ought to go and take advantage of this program or else you're going to drop out of school. And it's a really good program. Now, he didn't couch it quite like that, but I'm just simply trying to uh, put my own little personal spin on it here. We have to be careful whenever we talk about academic support programs for students. The more that we can embed the programs into the course in which all students end up participating, well, then you don't have the issue of stereotype threat because students don't think about it that they're high risk and we are really worried about you dropping out. If you don't know anything about uh, uh, Dr. Steele's work, just simply do a Google search on stereotype threat. Another issue is a stigma. I ended up working and directing learning centers at two community colleges and one four-year college in my career. I think learning centers and drop-in tutoring programs are very powerful. They're able to give a lot of assistance to students. One of the challenges is that, however, most of the time, those things were voluntary. You had to volunteer to go in to get the help. And from a student point of view, they appreciate that there's learning centers there. They appreciate what the tutors do for them, but they feel some stigma because they're going in to pick up that help. And that's the reason why many of the programs that I identified with that six at the earlier slide, well, they have mainstreamed their programs so that it's pretty seamless. Everyone's participating. It's a normal behavior. It's part of a workshop. It's part of an enhancement extended learning, lots of different ways to describe that. Now, what are the challenges with traditional study skills classes? Well, I've taught those before, and I'll have to recognize these were some challenges. Students had a large, really difficult time transferring from a standalone class in which they learn study skills and then how to be able to make application. Now, the best practices of these study skill classes now is that they end up having students bring in their textbooks and their homework from other classes, and they spend a lot of time doing integration work inside. So I'm not casting aspersion to all the study skills instruction that's going on. It just makes it harder. If we can somehow be able to integrate it seamlessly, it's going to be more effective. Another problem is that uh, study skill classes generally don't have any academic credit, and that causes difficulty. And then without support, students tend to revert back to their old habits. That's true for us as well. Think about our own selves, about choices about exercise or what we eat or positive habits that we're trying to develop or negative ones we're trying to get rid of. The students are no different than us. What's the problem in higher ed and what is it that these programs are dealing with? We don't want to talk about high-risk students. That's not true. What it is is that there's a mismatch between where the preparation level is for a lot of students and what the expectations are inside of the classrooms. That's not making a judgment about the students. It's not making a judgment about faculty members about being too hard and difficult or whatever. Not even trying to get into any of that. By talking about this mismatch, what we want to do is that we want students to raise their level of performance to meet Let's say if this is the faculty expectation level, we want them to meet it or to exceed it then. Or what are some common design features that you'll find inside of most peer learning programs? 
Once again, I could spend a half hour to an hour just talking about these theoretical frameworks. I just simply want to identify them for you here. Constructivism, zone proximal development with Vygotsky, uh, Aston, uh, student involvement, academic social integration, Tinto, situated cognition, Hattie, Biggs, and Purdy, uh, collaborative learning, the Johnson and Johnson brothers, all of those different theory bases help to drive all of these programs. And I would encourage you to pick some of these to learn more about if you're just getting into peer assisted learning. In most of these programs, they're all going to be run by either near peers or co peers. Near peers means that they're probably someone who's already taken this difficult, challenging course before, got good grades, received training, and they're back to help the currently enrolled students to do well. In co-peers, well, those are students who are inside that class for the very first time along with you, and they are running academic support programs. So those are kind of typical models for what we're doing in terms of what kinds of students do we select to help run these peer-assisted learning. What kinds of classes are being targeted? Well, generally, they're historically difficult. A long time ago, we used to talk about high-risk courses or high-risk students. Well, you seldom find that talked about in the professional literature anymore. It's stigmatizing. It's disrespectful to the faculty, disrespectful to the students. That kind of language is not helpful. But there are classes that are difficult. In my background, I came from something called supplemental instruction. The very first class that SI was offered in at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, was an anatomy and physiology class for students in med school. These were all highly capable students. For the most part, they were valedictorians coming out of their high schools, and now they're in med school. But it was a challenging course because of the vocabulary and the speed of delivery. You go across the United States, and if you talk with most A and P instructors and look at the grades, you end up saying that it's challenging. So we end up targeting those courses and provide supplemental services. So what's a magic number? Well, there's nothing magic about 30%. Uh, D's, F's, W's, and incompletes. It's just that that tends to be a class that is presenting itself to be difficult, and most students end up knowing it. Also, this idea about being a gatekeeper or a prerequisite class, and sometimes, and particularly now at the time that I'm recording this video, we're dealing with the flu pandemic here in the United States, uh, lots of college classes are now converting over within a period of three days over to online. And academic support programs are now moving also online. Well, online courses can be challenging and academic support can be provided online. But that's a whole nother series of videos. It's this whole idea about front-loading services. We need to get services in to students during their very first academic term. In fact, um, research from Tinto and others said that it's the first six weeks of the very first academic term that students most often make a decision to drop out of the institution. So this is the reason why we want to have our best services. We want to have additional services at that time. What are some common guidelines that go into these peer learning programs? I won't read through all the, the uh, detail that's on the screen here. I'd recommend that you um, hit the pause button uh, in order to be able to uh, drink in all of the content. Uh, but it's a pretty complex set of activities that are occurring. That's the reason why it takes a couple of days most, uh, most often to train these uh, student leaders of these peer learning groups. They spend lots of time during those two days of training doing mock sessions where they're practicing. They end up watching a lecture, they end up taking notes, and then they end up either working with the other 
facilitators in training, or they get a group of students to come in, and they end up creating uh, these mock sessions so they can practice implementing all the different kinds of uh, peer learning activities, uh, how to model uh, study strategies within a review of the content. Um, all of those kinds of things are pretty complex. It's the reason why training is an essential issue for helping programs to be effective. What is it that's happening inside of these sessions? Well, it's a lot more than only discussing the course content. That's important, but also they start to think about what it is that they're reading and hearing, and they're going to discover that they're missing things. And knowing that they're missing things helps them to become more attentive. And they listen to other students as well as the facilitator of these study groups. Well, how can I be more effective in tackling the material? They learn how to be able to analyze question. Uh, seek verifications. And also, they understand the world's a little bit different because of their own personal experiences. So it's a really rich environment that they're in. It's about this interaction that's occurring within the group. They're exploring new topics, and they're making application of the material. They're constructing their knowledge. That's the reason why um, the theoretical uh, underpinning for constructivism was mentioned on that earlier slide when talking about the different theory bases that under, underlie these programs. It is that if they don't construct the knowledge for themselves, if they're just doing gorge and purge, just trying to learn enough within the last 48 to 24 hours in order to do well on an exam, they're not going to remember any of that material. I mean, the forgetting curve is something like 98%. Well, we're trying to find ways that they can internalize this information, develop the skills needed, and also to retain the critical information that they're going to need later in the course and in future courses in the academic sequence. Inside of these groups, it's supposed to be highly interactive. And this is just simply a very clean model of what you hope happens inside of these sessions. You've got a facilitator, and then you've got a group of students. And at the beginning of the term, we don't really want them to be in high control, the facilitator, but they tend to kind of drive the study review sessions a little more because the students, they don't know how to be able to do a lot of these new kinds of study behaviors. For them, this is all new. So at the beginning of the term, you're going to tend to see a lot more control by the facilitator or leading or influencing, whatever word that you want to use. But what you want to see is that you want to see a change going on where more influence and power and control is taken on by the students. Now, there's still going to be some influence going on by the facilitator by the end of the academic term. But what you really want to be able to see is if you were an observer and you walked into a peer review session during the last two weeks of the academic term, ideally, you wouldn't be able to know who the facilitator was. You'd see that the students already are picking up on what are the things they need to do to unpack the last lecture and the assigned readings. And how is it to prepare for the exam? By the time that we have gotten to the end of the academic term over time, well, they're starting to develop their own mastery of how to be able to study in groups and also how to be able to study by themselves. You know, for a lot of students, whenever they come into a classroom, and almost despite all the good efforts of instructors, and I think about this for me, I just retired after being a history teacher for 40 years. And while everything seems terribly clear to me and connected and all the rest, well, sometimes this is the way it kind of looks like for students. You got your lecture notes, and then you got a textbook or online readings, and then you've got other readings they're responsible for. As a result of being in the peer learning groups, 
we now suddenly are able to create an organized ecosystem. Things make sense. Connections are made among the material. Students are making connections between what they know and what they've just learned. They're observing the behaviors of the other students. So this ecosystem here is critical to be developed. Well, what's it cost in order to develop these programs and implement them? Well, that's the reason why we talk about this partially as an investment as well as a cost. Training is going to be critical. Faculty need to be strongly supportive along with the administrators. There needs to be some more sort of a supervisor or call it a coach to be able to give feedback and additional training to these facilitators throughout the academic term because not only do the students need to learn new skills inside of the study groups on how to be more effective or they'll end up reverting back to their old behaviors, well, that can also happen to the facilitators. As one of the training directors that I had a chance to work with, Dr. Kim Wilcox, pointed out, one of the scariest things in the world is during the very first study review session. Whenever your students are inside of a room, you've circled them up uh, with their chairs so they are looking at each other, and you've closed the door to the classroom in order to cut down the noise, and it's just you. And suddenly you get nervous. Even though you're well-trained, you've practiced, you've done the mock sessions, it's easy for you to go back to a question and answer format because that's kind of a default that students understand. They kind of see you as kind of a teacher. The idea about you facilitating and turning the discussion back to them and asking them to help bring out the answers out of their assigned readings and their lecture notes or whatever quality of notes that they have. Well, that's really difficult, and that's the reason why you've got to have this occurring throughout the academic term. Well, we've got to pay the facilitators, and you've got other resources. The most expensive thing in any program is time. Over the years, I've had a chance to work with people who direct peer learning programs at hundreds of colleges in the United States and in other countries. And what I've noticed is that well too often, whenever a peer learning program is introduced to the campus and it is given to an existing learning assistance uh, program, whatever it's called, the learning center or whatever, this thing becomes an add-on activity. And somehow this just simply becomes another element that goes into the job duties for that person. That is a good way to condemn a program to not be effective. You've got to have enough time for the coaching and the training. You've got to have enough time to do evaluation. You have to have enough time for the person who is in charge of the program to be able to engage in their own professional development. And they need to have the funds to go to the national and international conferences that most all of these programs have. If you don't do those kinds of things, if we don't have the time, it's easy to throw money at an issue. But if you don't have the time, then it's better not to do it. Because my research looked at every single SI program in the United States back in, uh, would that be 1998 through 2000? And we found out one of the most critical factors about programs that collapse and stop working is that the supervisor reports, they were overwhelmed. It was too complex for them to have added on to everything else that they're doing. You know, what is one of the sayings? If you want to get something done, find a busy person and assign it to them because they'll figure out how to add it in to their work portfolio. Well, that's kind of a nice compliment to say about that person, and I'm sure that they do outstanding work, but you can also overwhelm someone. So that's the reason why I just wanted to point out this about implementation costs. What's the benefits of the program? Well, mostly they're focused on academic performance, 
They want to see higher persistence rates. And also, there's a lot of benefits for not only for the participants in the programs, but also for the student facilitators or leaders or whatever it is that they call the person, the student who's in charge of these groups. They also get a great deal out of it as well. And you'll see a slide coming up here in a moment. That'll be a place where you could read about that. But it is a way to improve for the students who participate as well as students who run the groups. Now, what do faculty members get out of this experience? Well, if they want it, they can request anonymous feedback through the study group leader, not identify what students are asking or making comment. But if the faculty member wants the feedback, you can get that. That doesn't tend to happen as much here in the United States, but that's a frequent thing that peer review groups are used for in other countries. I know that from personal experience in South Africa, that they saw that as a vital way to get information to faculty members who wouldn't gain it any other way then. You get more academically prepared students, faculty members like that. They're going to ask more uh, questions, better questions. We know that they're managing their study time. They're not just simply studying by themselves. They're working with other students, and faculty would like to know that then. Also, student satisfaction ratings for the class tends to go up. And then finally, the last thing is that this really helps out with large class sizes. So lots of benefits for faculty members out of a program. What's the institution get out of this? Well, they like to know that they're historically underrepresented students and difficult classes, high demand programs are doing well. They want to diversify the graduates. You know, one of the things that they do in the United Kingdom is that when they evaluate colleges, they look at the demographics of the students who are admitted, and it's expected that the graduation class will have the same ethnic and cultural and economic diversity as the students who came in. And if that's not happening, then there is a problem, and it actually can have an impact on funding for your institution. We haven't quite gotten to that yet here in the United States, but I think a lot of faculty and a lot of administrators of goodwill are really concerned about that, and that's part of the reason why some of these kinds of programs have been created. Obviously, there's more revenue if we're going to have higher persistence rates. We also have a way to provide academic support for students in online courses, and as I said, right now, this is March of 2020, um, most colleges in America are all shifting within a matter of days over to online instruction. We want to maintain high academic standards and larger classes. And then also, uh, as a good summary for the whole thing, what's the institution get? Well, we end, end up helping to achieve our mission and goals of the institution. What's the future of peer-assisted learning programs? Well, being mainstreamed and mandatory for all students. It's part of the class. It's part of the culture of the class. Number two is you'll see even beyond what's happened here this term, uh, here in the United States and I think with our colleagues around the world, online peer-assisted learning programs are here to stay. And we're going to continue to do these because we end up having higher participation rates. Even after this current flu pandemic passes, people are going to say, you know, by us doing things online, everybody in the class can participate if it's an out-of-class peer learning program. Well, everyone can participate because they can access it online. They don't have to come back to the campus in order to be able to participate. So I think it makes more sense. I think that we're going to have a need for new pedagogies of how you do it. Here at this particular moment, I monitor a number of the email uh, chat rooms on learning assistance, and people are talking about using, currently, they're using a product called Zoom. And I'm going to end up using Zoom coming up on this Sunday for a webinar. Well, that's uh, one product. There's lots of other ones that are out there. 
But the thing I want to get at is we have to think about how can we be more effective of how it is that we use the online systems in order to be able to have students have as an engaging, a productive kind of experience as they would have if they were meeting in the same classroom together for a study group. And then finally, my last one down here is one that I've just been learning about, and that's called Students as Partners. Students as Partners is a movement from Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, for the most part, and is gradually starting to trickle in to some U.S. institutions. What it means is that the students actually are seen as equal partners with the faculty member in helping to redesign the course. Pretty radical, but also it seems to make more sense that everyone needs to be a part of co-creation of the knowledge and also the co-creation of the way that the knowledge is gained inside the class. So I'm not going to say very much more here. I'm just frankly learning a lot at this point. I actually had no clue about students as partners until I had went to a conference in Australia in uh, October of 2019. I just simply want to highlight that for you, that maybe this movement of SAP is also going to have an influence with peer learning because here you have some really highly gifted people who are students who are helping to run these studio review sessions. Well, maybe these students can take on additional responsibilities with additional pay and such to help with co-creation and revision of the course. So those are just simply some thoughts for you on things that I think are going on today already, because a lot of programs already are mandatory and are mainstreamed, and there are already online PAL things that have been going on for years, even in already. So I just simply wanted to recognize some things that I'm learning. So if you want to learn some more, I highly recommend that you go to this website here, z.umn.edu slash peerbib. If you end up going to there, I end up maintaining an annotated bibliography on every publication by these groups here that's on the screen. At this point, there's something like 1,550 plus inside the database. And not only does the bibliography... Uh, available that you can download. But also I have a uh, topical set of bibliographies, including one that includes just publications about online delivery of these seven programs that are mentioned up here then. So that might be of high interest. Also there's bibliographies, topical ones on what are the benefits for facilitators? What are, there are the personal growth that participants are obtaining? Uh, and all the rest then. So once again, if you want more information, well, these are a number of websites that I maintain. I've already just shown you this peer bib one. That was the one I just spoke about. And then also, if you want to see anything I've ever written about peer uh, learning programs. Well, that one is the pubs peer. And then if you end up going to peer learning, well, that's a whole set of resources that have been developed by other people as well as by my colleagues here at the University of Minnesota. And then also finally down at the bottom, you end up seeing peer learning YouTube channel. And that's where I have detailed videos that go into a little more detail about each one of those different peer learning programs. Also, another benefit from that one is interviews with peer learning uh, facilitators, the students. And those are only about four to five minutes long, but it's nice to hear from the students' point of view what they're getting out of the experience then. You see my contact information down here at the very bottom of the slide uh, with my phone number, email, and also my web address. I would be delighted to keep up the conversation. I am learning so much 
uh, with peer learning. And now finally, as I'm in this next chapter of life, I've got more time for me to be able to learn more from other people. And then my goal is, is to share what other people have developed and have learned with other people as well. So uh, thanks for listening today. I hope my words are useful in your work in helping students to achieve their dreams. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.